just to give you some background, I've been doing this for 40 years as of this past January. I started when I was five. Okay, you're not buying that. But this is the longest period of time that I've spent in a single community in my 40 years of doing this, where I actually basically lived here. And so we've been here for almost three weeks now on just this trip. And we've been in Blowing Rock almost every single day of those three weeks, early in the morning, late at night, middle of the day, week in, week out, rain, no rain, you name it. And, uh, and I gotta tell you, it's incredible. What you have is amazing. Um, and so anyway, it's, it's been, that's where you really get a good sense of it. So I'm gonna dig right in with this thing. And, and I did this at the assessment. I just wanna give you uh, a repeat of why we're here. What else can be done locally to make Boeing Rock an even better, stronger, more desirable place to live, invest in, and visit? By the way, Having worked, we do probably 40% of our work is tourism, 60% is downtowns. So that's our two areas we work. And by the way, tourism doesn't work without a downtown because that's where most of the spending takes place. Particularly in your case where your downtown is really uh, one of the major reasons they're coming here. But you notice we bolded that live, place to live, is really important here and I want to give credit to your tourism development authority because most tourism development authorities don't do that by state mandate they're all about this and that's so congratulations and you know hats off to Tracy for saying we're doing a tourism development plan but about 90 percent of what you're going to see and and even in the plan is going to be about how do you make this work for both residents and tourism and so that is our focus, and I could even do the deeper dive, which I did the assessment, to help mitigate the effects of being an extremely popular tourism destination, okay? So that's really what this focus has been, and I think it's been really important for us to be here every single day during the peak season. And by the way, I was also here the beginning of May for several days, just so I could see it in what we call the shoulder season. So that's what we did. We did the visit during the shoulder season, see what it's like then. Um, and then we did during the peak season over the last several weeks. And now we've asked local residents, business, community stakeholders for their input. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. When we did the assessment, I gave you a bunch of suggestions. Having been in this business for so many years, here's what we suggest. As it turns out, what we saw is not so much different than what we heard from you. But I'm going to tell you what people have been saying. And then out of all this, we'll find the core issues, which I think we've pretty much done. And then the next step is how do we develop, how do we address these? And how do we do it in a timely manner? We believe, I do not believe in strategic plans. Sorry. I believe in action plans. Nobody wants to read a 300-page report where they read the executive summary and then they set it on a shelf and it gathers dust. We believe in action plans. For every recommendation you'll see in this, here's a brief description and a title of it. This is when it would be implemented. We believe an action plan is a to-do list. Even the table of contents has a check mark. You could go down the list. And then who would take the lead? Everybody plays a role. Chamber, um, uh, the town, uh, maybe Department of Transportation, the TDA, uh, historical societies, your foundation, uh, the civic society, everybody plays a role. And then what is the approximate cost and where would the funding come from? It's easy for people like me to throw out recommendations and say, good luck finding the money to do it. We think that's really critical. And then what's the rationale for making it? And that is what an action plan is. We always try to keep action plans to less than 100 pages. We do not do an executive sum, we do a vision. This is how we envision it would be like in Blowing Rock over the next, in three years from now or two years from now, whenever we accomplish a lot of these recommendations. And so in the assessment, that's what we did, assessment findings. And this is what we said, and I think it's really important for you to realize of all the communities, you have what 99.9% .9 of them wish they had, including the challenges you have. 
there are, there are in the United States, there are 19,500 incorporated places, cities, towns, villages, and 3,500 counties, 19,500. You're probably in the top maybe 100 of places out of those 19,000 that is dealing with the issues you were and, and that the other 19,300 wish they had. So, so it doesn't mean live with it, but it just means that I just want you to know where you're at. And in those, when I did this, we just provide suggestions. There was no recommendations in that assessment. And there were just suggestions. So one thing we did is the first thing we heard was, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're suffering from over-tourism. And, and this is the definition of over-tourism. I used to sit on the board of the United States Travel Association headquarters in Washington, D.C., and this was our definition of over-tourism. And in the first three, this is one, this is, this is the one area where you're dealing with over-tourism, was your infrastructure. And, and that's no surprise to you. And so the bottom line is, you don't suffer from over-tourism, you do suffer from a severe lack of parking, and that compounds traffic issues, it compounds frustration for both locals and, and visitors. Visitors are just as frustrated as you are. And so, we went out and we did ask for input from local residents. And I did nine easy questions, this is still live, this link right here, and that will be up till the end of July. So we're about halfway through that. And that is where there's a questionnaire. This is not meant to be a survey. It's a questionnaire asking for your input. And, and we, this is what we said. Thank you for your interest in making Blowing Rock an even better place to visit. So we put this up there. And um, we've been facilitating this. And by the way, I don't consider myself a consultant. I consider myself a facilitator. You can't, people from the outside can't come in here and tell you what to do, but we can help facilitate the process with your input. And that's what all of this is about. And so we did do this. And by the way, as of yesterday at about 6 p.m. when I was putting this together, you had 410 responses to the questionnaire, which is outstanding. It's just outstanding. Um, and that is really good, considering you have a, like a full-time population of 1,300 and about 5,200, you know, during the summer with, with you know, your part-time or seasonal residents. But to have 410 responses in that short order, I think is phenomenal. It gives us a good sense. So we ask people where they live, and here is what we've heard so far. 70% live within the town limits. So that's outstanding. 20% live within, they just live outside the area. And so you can see where the people that responded, 404 people out of the 410 actually put, and by the way, you weren't required to fill out every one of these. So you might see 404 or 390. It's just you fill out whatever you want. And so, and we even did hear from some visitors to the area. And when we're done with this, we'll be able to separate out what they said as opposed to what locals said, which is nice. It'd be interesting to see what, th what their take is versus what the local take is. The second question was, do you live here full time? How many months of the year? Where do you, you know? And, and so this was imp important too. And here we go. And this was really varied. I mean, uh, almost 40% live here full time. Uh, we have another. 40% that live here between, you know, basically, you know, um, up there, but very varied. Um, there wasn't very many people live here nine to 12 months and they're only gone for three months, which I would expect. So that's really good, really good balance there. Um, and so, and then finally, um, what is your age range? I think this is really important as well. These are the only three demographics we asked. And here was the response to that. 43% were more than 65 years old. 44% um, were 45. So really, like 80, almost 90% of them were 45 and older. I wish we'd hear from some younger folks, and maybe we will as the word gets out more. 
um, but we heard about 12% 30 to 44, um, 30 years old. So, so there you go for that one. And so now we get into the questions of what are the three things you like best about Blowing Rock besides its people? You know, we, we know the people are great. And so I just wanted to give you, we read through all of these, and I am going to just give you common threads. I mean, otherwise I'd be here all day on every question. But these are common things we heard. Um, the three things we like best, outdoor activities dominated it. I mean, it's your trails, it's uh, Bass Lake Trail, uh, uh, came a quaint small town charm was huge. Um, local shops, are, and by the way, these are in order of what the most common responses were. Um, parks and lakes, uh, walkability of downtown, safe and clean. Uh, do I have any more on this one? Uh, even the weather was a big asset for people. And I always want to try, I don't want this to be all negative. I want to say, what do you like about the area? And so I thought these responses were excellent and really gave us a good sense of why people like it here. And then we asked, what are your three biggest challenges you see for blowing rock? And I did the town so they don't just start taking talk shots at the mayor. So, <laughs> and so, um, so there are three biggest challenges. And here are the common themes that we heard in this. Parking, parking, parking. And then what else do we hear? Oh yeah, parking, parking, parking. Out of the 400 and how many people responded to this, parking was like 350 of them. I mean, this is nothing new. Probably the one thing we heard more than anything else was this line. And uh, the line is burned in my brain and it is quit kicking the can down the road. And this is not a, a shot at the counselors. This has, been, this has been a problem here for far more than the last couple of years or four years. Or, so this goes way back. Um, we also heard traffic congestion, noise, and a lot of that's about the lack of parking. Um, you know, the cost of living, lack of affordable housing came up. And, and that's something we're also going to tackle. Um, cost of living is hard to do. And, and, um, and that's going up everywhere. I mean, lack of good paying jobs here locally came up a lot. Uh, I'm just telling you everything, you know, it's just too busy. Too many tourists did come up a lot. Um, you know, it was hard to access restaurants. Uh, that we heard that possibly losing its soul. These are the core things. I don't know if I have any more up there or not, but, but um, but that was a really good one. We're losing that, we're really afraid we're going to lose what we love. And that's absolutely, uh, I think, important. And by the way, if you have questions about these, go ahead and interrupt me. We did hear, you know, funny things. There were several shots at Democrats. Um, somebody said that uh, we should charge people by how much they weigh by the pound so that we can have more room on our sidewalks. I mean, so we heard there were some sarcastic ones, some funny ones, uh, um, you know, but, but generally speaking, everybody was very, very serious about the questionnaire. But what do you think we do to make it a better place to live and visit? We want to say, what do you think the challenges are? Well, what can we do to make it better? So here's our challenges. What are your ideas? And, and of course, you're going to see the same thing again, fix the parking problem. And then even people said, maybe we should have resident parking permits where you have, uh, you know, maybe you have a structure or something that's just for residents. I mean, that came up so that residents have that. So that's an idea. Um, that wouldn't be to figure out how to do, but improve the signage for both vehicles and pedestrians. That came up a lot. Um, you, there were people that said, we need more restaurants. I went, oh my gosh, you know, you already have 32 restaurants in a year round population of like 1500 people. And so, but then there was also several comments about you should allow food trucks, uh, which is a totally different experience than, than, um, than restaurants. So that actually came up. Um, better and wider sidewalks, crosswalks, pedestrian signals, and hats off to the council. Uh, just this week, if you don't know, they did pass a you know, resolution to, to 
address crosswalks and pedestrian signals, and so thank you very, very much, Down. So a lot of these things we didn't know in the assessment, you are already working on, and so hats off for doing that. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean wider sidewalks right now, but at least crosswalks are, are part of this and getting pedestrian signals. Shops should be open during the evening hours, and this is a big one. And this one here is important message to get to your retailers. According to the National Retail Federation, I know that includes big box, but it also includes small shops, 70% of bricks and mortar retail shopping takes place after 6 p.m. 70%. And you roll up your sidewalks at 6 o'clock other than your restaurants. And, and just so you understand this, is during the day, we can be at Bass Lake. We can be walking your trails. We can be out at Moses Cone. We could be out horseback riding. We could be kayaking on, what is it, Price Lake. Um, we, could be, we could be out uh, golfing at the country club. We could be all of these outdoor activities in the mountains, going to Grandfather Mountain, uh, you know, doing all of these things. Then we come back to you at 6 o'clock, and you're closed. And I've seen it. People going down the street, looking in shop windows. You know, they're here for dining, but everything else rolled up. In the town of Springdale, Utah, population 600, and, and I'm not trying to make you turn into Springdale, but population 600, close to Zion National Park entry, every single one of the retail shops is open till 9 o'clock at night during the summer season. And they have the highest per capita retail sales in the state of Utah. And it's not because all the locals, 600 people are spending that much money, it's the visitors. And so that, that one there, I really took note of. Now that's something you can't make shop owners stay open later, but they'd be better opening at 11 and staying open till eight you know, than, than opening, being open nine to six or nine to five. I mean, and so that was something that I, I agree with. Overhead power lines, bury them while you have the chance came up. And I know this is a, a I guess a price estimate that was like $17 million. And I think a counselor even asked me in our list of priorities, would you put that ahead of parking? I went, no, because parking, we're, you know what? We're still gonna come here even if you have power lines overhead. But if you have parking issues like you have, next time I may not say, I'm not sure I wanna go there again because I was facing the same problem you as residents faced. But if, if there's the ability, you can get grants. If I, a beautiful historic downtown, would love to see that happen. Enforce the speed limit on 321. And by the way, um, we're staying down in Lenore. So I have this beautiful drive every day coming here. This morning, it was foggy down there. It was fun coming through the clouds and up here, it's beautiful. But I have, you know, I think where you have the speeding problems on 321 is just between your two main street entrances because it's downtown both ways and there's no traffic calming at the bottom. Because coming up these hills where it's 25, you know, 25 miles an hour and a 35 speed limit, but once you hit this little stretch, people think it's back to 55 or whatever. And I have not been out on 321, and remember, we've been coming to Blowing Rock every single day, except one where I was out at the Highland Games last Friday. And, and um, but this is that one stretch where, where if I'm going 40 in a 35, I'm passed by everybody. But I also have never seen a day where I have not seen police out on 321. You know, either driving or, or parked with radar on. But that is a concern, and I've seen it. And it's just in this little dip right here. And you have no traffic calming at sunset in 321. That would slow people down. They're just blowing through to, on their way to Boone or vice versa. So we did see that. Enforce the use of Airbnb as short-term rentals came up numerous times. Um, that's where people are renting houses for short-term, even though I think your ordinance is what, say 28 days or something like that. Um, apparently some people must be abusing that. Um, and so enforce was in all caps where I saw that one. Develop a dog park down here. Now somebody, uh, several people said there's an acre 
There's an acre of land down here. I don't know if it's kind of behind the chamber, Charles. Where, where's this acre at that I keep hearing about downtown? Between Broyhill Park and... Next to the pool, there's an acre land. So anyway, somebody, several people kept saying that somewhere, because a lot of people come here with dogs. I mean, I've seen it. You know, I've seen both residents and visitors walking dogs. And so somebody said somewhere we should have a dog park. I thought that was a really good idea. Several people mentioned this acre somewhere could be developed into part of a dog park and make it more parkland and fill that gap. I have no idea. I haven't walked the property. I don't know if it's for sale, but I'm just telling you what people have said. So these are things that are really, I think, are really outstanding input. More activities for younger people. I said we need street dances, events geared to kids, outdoor movies, uh, recreation center came up. Um, and so, so these, are, these are just things we've heard that we're going to take into consideration. And so that's that one. Then the next set was, if there was one thing you'd like the town to do right away to make it an even better place to live, work, and play, what would it be? And of course, this list, you can imagine where we're going, add more parking, fixed parking. Um, we actually did a word search of the 400 and some odd people that responded, and the word parking came up in like 350 of them. And so crosswalks and sidewalks, more wider repair. There were complaints about near Morris Street, sidewalks being uneven and being a trip hazard. Um, that came up, and so that's something I'm going to check out. And that's something that, by the way, the town's already working on. More music in the park, more local talent front and center, which I totally agree with. I mean, you have so much cultural depth here, but you don't really see it. Outside of Brom, you don't really see a whole lot. Um, you know, I mean, Speckled Trout had a musician out there. I know the market is going to start adding music. I would just love to see that. I'd like to see it almost every day in Memorial Park, having music there, live music. Add bike lanes, bike rats, stroller, park, stroller parking areas um, came up over and over again, which the only way you could really do that, and this would be maybe way down the road. I want you to think way down the road, not, not, in, the, not in our plan. Down the road, if you had parking structures and trolleyways, you've got people parking somewhere else. Down the road, wouldn't it be great? Downtowns are about people, not cars. So way down the road, you might say, well, maybe it's time to move our parking off of Maine, except during early morning, you know, and, and, and then we could widen our sidewalks. You're going to have a greenway going through here. That greenway is not going to be a huge tourism attraction in itself, it's going to be a great asset for locals, and it will help spread out your visitors because now they have that. Um, I think doing the sidewalk down to, uh, to Bass Lake, is that already approved? I think that's awesome. I just went, yes. So you're doing some great things. But in order to add bike lanes, bike racks, stroller park, the only way you can do that is to add wider sidewalks. The only way you could add side or wider sidewalks would be to either get rid of traffic, a parking on one side of the street and not the other, or down the road, widening your sidewalks and doing that. So a good, a good idea. Um, but for me, I'm not so sure we're gonna address it in the five-year plan. Um, I think having some bike racks would be really nice. And then add a recreation center with pool year round. So people kept talking about the pool being too seasonal. Um, you know, I'm not sure that we'll address that in our plan because this is really more tourism, but have more shops featuring local arts and crafts. I heard that a lot. And that's even something my wife and I, who have secret shopped thousands of towns, you know, Moses Cone, you know, a little gallery out there um, in the residence. And is that Flat Top Manor? Is, it's a beautiful home, and they're working on it right now, but, but I couldn't believe how much money we spent out there because we couldn't find that kind of art in downtown Bowling Rock. Art in the park. Art in the park, fantastic. But wouldn't it be great? I thought, may, when I saw that, I thought, maybe, we, maybe there should be a co-op gallery somewhere in town. You know what I mean? A little art, artist co-op. Okay, Amanda, did. Where we had all you had one. It didn't work. Okay, good. So anyway, I thought that was, that was good. They would like to see more local art. 
improved social media footprint for locals came up. Um, let's see, do I have more there? Really clear, really clear. Heard it over and over and over and over and over and over. Uh, so much so, it should be the town's absolute number one priority. And I know as counselors, this is tough because you're talking about police and fire and roads and road repairs and sewers and everything else on your list. But if you want to talk to your residents and your visitors, number one priority by far. And then when friends and family visit you, where do you take them? Now, in 90% of the time when we do questionnaires like this, when visitors come, they take them out of town. What's interesting is what we heard. You know, Main Street, that was number one. We walk Main Street. That came out, that was probably two-thirds of local shops was number two. Local restaurants was number three. I mean, Bass Lake was number four. Price Lake for boating was right up there. Grandfather Mountain, Abram, I mean, Moses Cone, Tra Moses Cone Trails came up so often that I told Jane, my wife, I said, man, I wish we would have had more time to go do those. I mean, it came up so often, it's like, ah, we missed that one. I mean, we know where they are. The Mass General Store, uh, Kilwins, of course. And, and what was interesting is we buy it there and we take it to the park to eat it which I thought was fantastic. Um, the Blue Ridge Parkway, of course. Uh, the Blowing Rock was there. Uh, hiking was number five, right? After those first four of, of where do you take people? But what was really interesting in this, out of all of these, all of these, only two people out of 400 said, I won't take them anywhere because there's too many tourists or I go to Boone. Only two out of 400 were taken visitors, their friends and family, out of town. So congratulations, Blowing Rock. That's pretty outstanding. In spite of your parking issues and everything, only two people said, I take them somewhere else. And I thought, that's great, that's fantastic. So, there you go. That, that's hats off to Blowing Rock for that, okay? And then the rest said, you know, Blowing Rock, Bass Lake, Mosco Trails, you know, they were, all, they were all in Blowing Rock. Even when Tweetsie, you know, all of those. And so that, I thought, was very, very fascinating and different than we see in other places, considering your parking issues. And then is there anything else to add? And by the way, I couldn't believe how many people, um, I don't have how many responses there, even after giving them all of this they still had more to add. And that's where we came up with little things like, how can you improve on perfection? I was really surprised that in this, almost 80% of this was bragging about how great Blowing Rock is, not complaining. 80% of these, what else do you want to add? We love Blowing Rock. I like it the way, I like the way the leaders have kept the charm of the town. Visitors need evening activities. Shop shut down at five or six. Um, bury the power lines. I mean, this is, you know, wayfinding from 321 to downtown. By the way, if you go to Boone, it'll say historic downtown. If you go to Lenore, it says historic downtown. If you go to Hickory, it says historic downtown. The only city without wayfinding is Blowing Rock. The only one in this whole from Hickory to the other side of Boone. Only town where there's no signs that tell you where downtown is. So, you know, um, get parking under control. But, but generally hosting events, so we, that, we, that, that was a big one that we heard, is that we, if we can't already handle the visitors, and people, they love art in the park, but then they complain about that we can't even handle it without art in the park. And so this is where, once again, it's back to parking. It's not the event, it's the issue of where do we put people. And so uh, traffic calming, 321 engine braking came up. Um, I mean, these are all common themes that we saw over and over. 
Uh, one thing we heard uh, many times was we need to clean the streets and sidewalks more often. I don't know how often you have street sweepers come down Main Street or Sunset, but a lot of people said we need it more often. So, so those are something we'll find out about and, and maybe address. Um, don't fold the one or two. Oh, this came up. People can, I, as a matter of fact, I probably saw this probably 200 times is apparently there was some plan to do a nice gateway down there at sunset and 321. And I don't know if, if that's still on the table or not, but a but, uh, uh, hundred people or more said, why didn't that ever happen? And then a couple of people said, well, we fold to one person, you know, and then we just, we, somebody comes in complains, so we just ditch it. Yet I kept hearing over and over and over that one. Make it stand out. And that would make, even make the crosswalk stand out. Do something in that intersection to slow traffic there. Create a nice gateway down there. So anyway, and I know there's plans for that because I saw them. And so I think that would be, I thought that was a good one. And this was really a common, our positive far outweigh the negatives. And these are actual, the ones you see in quotes were actual quotes. And so anyway, with this, Create a cultural affairs committee. I thought, well, there you go. I mean, people want to, you know, one thing I must tell you, that, that for the 4th of July parade, I saw one person of color out of like 3,500. And I thought, that, and that's something I started to take notice of, is that this community is lily white almost all the time. And so I thought that would be pretty cool. I kept thinking, man, what we need here is a jazz festival. What we need here is a little more maybe diversity even in your food offerings. I mean, no offense, but most of your restaurants sell pretty much the same thing. And, and so I thought that, that actually a pretty good idea. Um, people love the fact the sidewalk to Bass Lake is a reality. I think that's awesome for the town. Quit talking and do something, quit kicking the can down the road. I don't know how many times I heard that. Um, and that was mainly about parking. Um, so he said, we need an Italian restaurant. And my wife said, absolutely. <laughs> um, need more music and cultural depth, which comes back to the first one on the list. Uh, so these are, these are things that, that I think are great. But nearly all of the anything else question was overwhelmingly positive overwhelmingly. Usually when we do questionnaires, it's people's chance to vent. And we did get venting. There are some responses. We never limited anybody to how many characters. And there were some responses that when I printed them out were two pages, single space, small type. <laughs> and so not only did we do the online survey, I spent two days, and I'm still doing it, meeting with stakeholder groups, including the Blowing Rock Civic Association, other residents of Blowing Rock that are not part of the Civic Association, uh, the town council, um, educational groups, parents in education, frontline employees, lodging properties, retail merchants, uh, your restaurants. So I met with all these groups to get their input, uh, real estate professionals, um, you know, Chamber of Commerce, I mean, you know, we're meeting with everybody we can, and here's what we heard from these groups. Challenges. Parking at the school is taken up by local employees. As visitors, I didn't even know about the school parking until I met with Patrick, the principal. And he told me that and went, oh, great. Guess where we parked for Fourth of July parade? Yeah, the school. But as visitors, we wouldn't know it's down there. But they even said it's mainly, we see the same cars down there every day. So much so that their staff members at the school don't have a place to park. And so that was, that was interesting. Uh, trash pickup on Thursdays competes with the school traffic, particularly at the corner of like Morris and, and Main Street. They're picking up trash the same time you've got parents bringing kids to school. And so they said that, was, that creates a real conflict there, particularly there, and there was a lot of that. Ugh. So that was frustrating. Um, and it's right, it's like 7.45 in the morning, they're picking up the trash the very same time, school buses and kids and parents are all trying to do that. 
So I don't know what the solution is, but that's why we're here is to listen. And no marketing to homeowners or little marketing homeowners came up. Um, antiquated zoning. Um, just so you know, this is something I'm going to tackle. The days of requiring X amount of parking spaces for X amount of retail ended in 1980. You guys are 40 years behind the times. These days, we're about shared parking. And so, and we're about Etsy style shops, those little 500 square feet of, of little bakeries, like cupcake shops. How are they gonna go out there and have three parking spaces? I think I was really, one thing that kind of, it bothers me a lot, is when I hear from a merchant that gave up a parking space on their property to accommodate more pedestrians and people and they're paying $15,000 to the town for giving up a parking space. I'm going, what? I, I was shocked. So I haven't dug into that yet, but, but antiquated zone, I think a lot of your zoning, a lot of your things that you do there, I think are pretty antiquated and probably need to be readdressed. Every commercial project re requires a conditional use permit, and I have never seen that in a town. Usually, if you have a zoning, if you fit within the zoning, you don't have to have a conditional use permit. If you don't fit within the zoning ordinance, then you do. So maybe the zoning needs to be tightened or something. But I was kind of surprised by that. And I do a lot of urban planning. It's mainly my background. Um, so that was something we heard. And then there's so much red tape. You know, if you, when I walk this downtown when the merchants are closed up, and they put in all their indoor. You have some shops and restaurants that look pretty shabby. But when I talk to property owners, they say there's so much red tape, it's not worth doing. They go, first of all, I guess you can go to a planning commission, and usually the planning commission is the final authority on zoning, things like paint. I heard from people that said, the council will sit down and they'll talk about a paint count, a paint color for a shop for three hours. I'm going, why is the council involved in that? That should be planning board or planning commission. That, I don't know why council is even in the weeds with this. And we heard a lot about council being in the weeds. When it comes to building permits and zoning and things, usually that's why you have a zoning, com a planning commission and a planning board and then maybe you need to tighten your zoning or something if everything has to have a conditional use permit. But, but there were so many people said, I would love to improve my building, but it's not worth the fight. And that was really sad to hear. Um, and by the way, it doesn't mean you sell your soul. I totally agree. You want to keep the charm here. You know, and, and um, but I did, these are just, I'm telling you what we heard. A rental of town buildings for weddings and private fun. Um, severely, I could understand anybody wanting to have a wedding in Blowing Rock. But I've heard from people that say when a wedding comes in, they'll say, we want to take, is it Lyons down at Broyhill? Legion. A Legion building. They say, we want the Legion building and we want the entire parking garage for a wedding. And it's like, oh, we can't do that. And so there was some comments about when we rent the town buildings to that, a lot of times it's during peak weekends and everything, we just can't accommodate it. Okay, so we heard about that. I'm just telling you what we heard. Need more coordinating of events. Um, and so, uh, you know, let me keep going here. School auditorium is underutilized. They have like 220 seats. And I thought, well, that's, that's a great asset. A lot of complaints about permitting. Um, I mean, this is, this, I heard this. So this is not me. This is just coming from what I've heard out there. And by the way, this is not something about this council. This has apparently been going on for a long time, a long time. And so I, I just think, I think, I hope the council can get out of the weeds and let planning departments do their job. And if you need tighter zoning, I think those are things that, that you can handle, uh, that you should do if that's a problem. Ideas, locals night for residents, like on a slower night. I thought that's a really cool idea. However, I will tell you one thing, is in New York City, visitors are going to Times Square. 
So in New York City, they created Bryant Park. If you've been to Bryant Park, it's where they have the ice skating rink. It's outside the New York Library, right in Manhattan and everything. But the second they made Bryant Park about the locals, that's where all the visitors went. Because as visitors, we want to go where you go. We like hanging out with you as local residents. And so, so but I, do, I thought that was a good idea. I mean, these are ideas we heard. Uh, somebody, uh, several people said, remove the parking in front of Kilwins for public safety, just that block. They said just on that side street, that block would allow you to create wider because that's the one place I saw with lines. And so somebody said, remove those. I don't know what there is, six parking spaces or something. So these are just ideas. These are not our recommendations. Um, officers strolling Main Street during peak days. Um, and they just said having, whether it's police officers or cadets or and I don't even know they have to be uniformed. I don't think people feel unsafe here at all. Um, but it's just having people like concierge or ambassadors just walking up and down Main Street and you know, being there to answer questions. So that came up as an idea. Uh, at public restrooms, there should be, if there's a problem, call this number you know, so that people will know if you're out of toilet paper, if there's a problem, or they got vandalized. They said there should be a little sign right there that, that just addresses that, where, where somebody could call if there's an issue. Um, people, we heard ideas of like, well, wouldn't it be cool if we did a Boone and Banner Elk experiential shuttle to Blowing Rock? Where in these towns, they're not driving. We create a shuttle in the morning and then it goes back in the afternoon and they're here on foot. So, you know, who, no, who knows? These are, I think they're all good ideas. There is no bad idea. School parking fundraiser that you've done in the past where kids will be out there on Main Street saying that there's free parking and they can do it by donation. They can sell bottles. I thought that's brilliant. I'd like to see you do that more often. I think that's really great. What, you know what's really cool? is When you have your local kids doing things like that, number one, they're learning about commerce and they're able to sell bottled water or whatever. I mean, this could be on weekends at the school parking lot. I just think it endears us to the town. That's why I like having your, your school in town. It makes you a real community. And so I thought, I think that's a brilliant idea. I wish there was more of it. Somebody said cover the t tennis courts downtown or are they pickleball, tennis, whatever they are, right at Memorial Park. So you can get these bubbles that kind of go over and they're like a white tent, like a, a, tr a Quonset hut that you can do to make them year round. So that was another idea. But then there were people I said, get rid of the tennis courts and make that more of an amphitheater. You know, they just said they don't get used enough and we could use more public assembly space. So, so there's, and a couple of people mentioned moving the tennis courts over to that acre lot that, that I was just mentioning. Um, and, or, or yeah, somewhere by the pool. Um, remove parking on Main, all of this stuff came up. So these are ideas, okay? And then do not remove, I guess during COVID, there are people doing outdoor dining. And I heard overwhelmingly that when, now that we're emerging out of COVID, hopefully, that don't take that away from us. And, and I would agree with that, that, that you shouldn't. So they're saying, please don't take that away from us. People love outdoor dining. Make sense? So downtown development master plan, that came up to do one, I totally agree. That would help fix zoning issues and everything. $2 per, I kept bringing up a dollar an hour for parking downtown, but I heard from dozens of people that said, Make it $2, $8 to park downtown for four hours. This is with a four hour time limit, piece of cake. And I thought, good point. Um, a shuttle and stronger partnership with the equestrian show. Um, the, uh, the, I talked to the gentleman from, that does the, what is the equestrian show? Is it, is that what, what do you call it, equestrian show? Okay, and they have 2,700 people here for 21 days. And they said it's a $7.7 .7 million economic impact. That's how much they're spending in the area. And so they said, cater to us, create shuttles so that we can bring our horse people downtown without driving downtown. And then shuttles between the app ski mount during the peak week. And these are all ideas. Golf cart access to downtown crosswalks on 321 from uh, Green Park Inn, from the Country Club, 
Um, so there was, that was another idea that came up. Um, tourism marketing to other states. Um, there were comments that said we need more overnight visitors and, and not concentrate so much on day trippers. And so, um, you know, maybe do a zoning overlaw on Main Street and Sunset that doesn't allow any additional chains or franchise downtown. And I do agree that having a subway in downtown, I think would be a nightmare, or a Dairy Queen or a McDonald's. I mean, I just, I just can't see that. I'm fine with, with Mellow Moose, you know, that's a chain. I mean, Kilwins, I mean, those are fine, they've been here. But, you know, just be careful about that. And I sometimes, that's necessary. You know, when it comes to tourism, I did a webinar yesterday. I used Blowing Rock as the example. That blue circle is basically your drive to market. People will do a day trip if they can get here within two hours, um, you know, generally within that. But if you want the overnight market, look at that huge area that you would have. These are people that would drive four to five hours. These are the people, if they're going to drive typically visitors, if they have to drive three hours or more to visit you, then they would spend the night. Now, I'm not saying we're trying to get everybody from Atlanta to come here. We got to solve how many people you have now. But, but the, the comment was, we'd like to get more overnight visitors and, and not have so many day visitors. So these are just ideas. And I started looking at that, what that area would be like. Um, locals within the town, one of the challenges you have is, we did hear from a few people that said, these businesses in downtown Blowing Rock cater to tourists, not locals. The challenge is two thirds of your locals are seasonal residents. They're only here when the tourists are here. When, every, when all the seasonal residents and the tourists are gone, most of them, like in December, January, February, March, maybe even April, your town is like 1300. See what I mean? Because we don't have the seasonal and we don't have the heavy tourism. And so how does a hardware store downtown, which you already have one nearby, or a barber shop or a shoe repair, they can't make enough money on just that, those other few months where your population drops by two thirds. Does that make sense? By the way, one thing you will find in towns like Blowing Rock is when you approved 321, you made it piece of cake easy to get to Boone, and that's where all the big boxes, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, all that stuff. And when you, that's what happens when you prove highways. We just, it's just too easy to get there for the big box. And so you're going to have these little shops that you have, which I think fant are, are fantastic. So anyway, this is, your, this is basically, I sat there and I looked at who's coming here, who do you market to? Women make 70% of the decisions of where we're going to live, where we're going to work, where we're going to visit. I'm waiting. Usually there's a guy in the audience that says, that's all. But you're generally catering to women, late 30s, early 40s. This is who we saw here. These are professionals. They're middle to higher incomes, uh, traditional families with kids. Um, you know, I mean, on 4th of July, during the parade, there, I counted 54 strollers in your downtown. But even during the weekday and on weekends, I count a, a couple dozen. Living in eight states within a five hour drive. I mean, strong love of outdoor activities. Um, you know, I think this is kind of your target market to get people to spend the night here. Okay? So I think it was really good. Your, uh, this would include like girls weekends out, multi-generational visitors, celebratory escapes, you know, whether it's a wedding anniversary, graduations, all of those things. By the way, one thing about tourism I want to talk to you about is during COVID, you were one of the, and I've said this before, you were one of the very few communities in the United States see an increase in business. Most cities and towns saw their tourism drop by 90%. This year, there's a huge pent-up demand. This year, you are, you, you're seeing a lot of overrun last year and this year. This will start to level off in 2022. What's happening in 2021, and I watch all of the Longwoods International, all of the, all of the Travel and Tourism Research Association, and they're telling you that 2020 
in Blowing Rock and, and along the Blue Ridge was one of the few spots in the United States that saw increases. In 2021, we're seeing huge pent-up demand. Now, they said, oh, now we have a new strain of COVID and 50, we're seeing 50% increases. The general American consensus is we're done with it. We're done with it. We're heading out to the mountains. And so this year, you're going to see family reunions like never before. You're going to see even more people this year in Blowing Rock than probably last year because people are just saying, we're done. We're there. We're coming. I do believe you're going to see it start to taper off a little bit next year. It doesn't mean you don't need to address parking, by the way. But I sat there and I photographed the parade. I even watched after the parade when like half the people left and still watched over all these weeks who is coming here and who are these people. I did not see you attracting the same audiences I see in Gatlinburg, in Pigeon Forge. Totally different. And, and they're, I think they're far more upscale here than what I see in other, what I call budget-friendly destinations, which I think is good. Um, public information to improve communications where this is ideas that are still coming from meeting with all these groups. Create a business improvement district downtown to make it more of a public-private partnership. That might come out of, out of uh, doing a downtown development master plan. A fitness center is needed downtown for both visitors and residents. And that one I went, yeah, that would be great. Um, you'll need a much broader variety of dining options, more ethnic choices. Uh, may you park ball fields. Somebody said convert that to an amphitheater or an event, vi event venue. I'm not even sure I know where these are. Are they out on 221? Are they by the pool? Where are these? There, what's that? Oh, that's right here. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay. I need much better marketing of local trails with signage at each. Um, need 5K, 10K runs, more things that are athletic and outdoor oriented, amateur health events. You know, I would love to see a small amphitheater in downtown, even like at Memorial Park, just that holds like a couple hundred people where you have a stage, you could do cooking demonstrations, you could do music, you could do a theater, you could do anything that are health events, healthy living type things, educational opportunities. Um, so we met with them, but I'm still going to meet with Wendy from the Greenway. I'm still going to meet with New, uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation. I still haven't even met with your tourism board because this has all been public outreach. Um, that happens today. Um, I haven't even met with Tracy and Amanda. I mean, I've talked to them, but we've not, we haven't even sat down for more than five minutes. So, because this whole process is about public first. Public first, our secret shopping and hearing from you. Um, and then working with lodging owners, we are asking lodging owners to just tell us where your occupancy are, is by month. If you're 100% full in June and July and August, then you know what? We don't need to put heads in beds. We can start concentrating shoulder seasons. But we need to, so we're trying to work with them. And how is it weekdays? We found vacancies in this town in the middle of July on weekdays. And so the, we're working with them to try to, how do, can we even out your tourism? So it's more 12 months, which you're growing towards, and less so much impact in a 90, 120 day or 180 day period. Um, and so we're trying to find out what holes to fill. So I'm telling you, we're still doing this. Um, and this is still going on. These are recommendations we're going to make based on everything we've heard. Addressing the parking dilemma. And, and I use this in the assessment. It still stands true. That right there. This should be the number one priority, plain and simple. And um, I mean, I showed that in the assessment. I'm showing it to you again. No wonder. You know, we were here, you know, a couple of times where we had to spend an hour to try to find a parking spot. And um, 
I've been refining these numbers. I've given, I gave a set of numbers at the assessment. I gave a, a set of numbers to the town council. This is refined. I actually walked downtown and actually listed all the shops, all the restaurants, and I actually walked into shops to see how many employees were there. This is what we found. Downtown workers, retail shops, there were 69, and the average number of employees was three. Okay? And then we went to restaurants. There are 14 restaurants right in downtown. And by the way, I talked to like the owners of Story, is it Story Street Grill? Um, they, she said that they have like 14 employees at any one time. A couple other restaurants said they had 18. I put down just 12, 14 restaurants times 12 employees. So I way underestimated on restaurants how many workers at restaurants there are downtown. But I'm trying to be conservative here. And then, and then I even did, people complain real estate takes up. So, so I did, there's six real estate offices we saw downtown. And if there was four agents or people in there, you'd have 24. Well, guess what this adds up to? Look at the difference. I, I really? You don't even have enough parking for people. And, if I, and by the way, there, there's an asterisk right there. This does not include any people that are parking for town hall, public works and parks, chamber and tourism, the school, library, or banks that might be using public parking spaces. Most of these have their own. But, and if I, if I just went to 14 employees per restaurant, you have more workers parking downtown than you have room for. That's how short of parking you are. You can't even accommodate your downtown workers. <laughs> I mean, there's, I, I, and this is physically walking in and talking to people. And so, so that, I mean, you know, even, even at these conservative numbers, oh, shoot, I didn't mean to do that again, but um, even doing these conservative numbers, you have 15, you have 15 spaces available. <laughs> now, now, granted, that doesn't include the school's parking lot that people are using. It doesn't include the church parking lots of which the churches are kind enough to let people use. You know, but still, that's just how much of an issue this is. There's where you need to be. That's how short you are long term. I mean, and, and by the way, I don't think you should add any more parking downtown. I really don't. People say, why don't we add another, another parking garage on top of your existing? I don't think you should for the, the, the aesthetic beauty, let alone the engineering of re-engineering the lower levels. You know, and so, but I think what you need short term is that right there. That has not changed from the, our first weeks here. You have to remember, I've been doing this for 40 years. That is what you need. And that is going to be our recommendation. You know, unless, and why we're still listening to you. And I even figured out, by the way, the average cost of park structure is 21.5. I added $2,000 per parking space if we have to mitigate the site and to make it look aesthetically pleasing, even out on 321. Nobody wants to see a big, huge, concrete, ugly structure out there. We want to see something that's aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, even out on 321. So $2,000 per space to make it look nice. So that would be a cost of $14 million. I mean, plus, architectural, engineering, all of that soft cost. We're talking about a project that's $16 million. Now this freaks people out considering, Shane, what's the town's budget a year? 12 million. <laughs> See what I mean? So, so with that, federal transportation grants that are out there, um, there's gonna be more, might pay for like 5 million of it. I think you could get that, I really do. Um, the net cost of development, if you could do that, would be 11.2, okay? 
And so, I mean, the town already owns that site. Um, and I don't want to get into site specific. I've, I've heard down at Tanger, across the street from Tanger. I mean, but, but you know, you have a retaining wall there, you have a retaining wall down that side, you'd have landscaping there. Uh, you'd have landscaping along the Main Street side with maybe a sidewalk on that side or crosswalks over to the Chitola side. Um, you know, then you could even people coming from Boone direction would see welcome to Blowing Rock. Uh, maybe it's not free. I would actually charge for public parking. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, and so this is an idea. And that little space right there is like the, about the size of a good sized truck. So you could do quite a bit with this site. That might be one. Plus, you'd have shuttles like this, something that's experiential, not just buses. You'd have a shuttle that's part of the experience like this one, which is private. By the way, let me go back to that. Run every 15 minutes between 8 in the morning and 9 p.m. And not just on Fridays and Saturdays. We need to be consistent so that workers will park there and not downtown. So... I think that's a beautiful shuttle. I'd like to see. I think it'd be great if you owned a couple of those, you know. But on them, you need to have like this is over in in uh, in uh, Springdale, Utah. Park in town. Ride the free shuttle design. So it can be park park here and ride the free shuttle to downtown Blowing Rock. You need to make it really obvious that that is available for them. Then you would need a trolley stop, like this little building there that's kind of in the shade there. Um, that's just, that's a trolley they're using in Walnut Creek, California. But I also think you need a couple of trolley stops. Just trolley stops. They don't have to be exactly like this. This one happens to be in Gatlinburg. But something along this line, wherever the parking garage is, and one place downtown. Just all you need is one stop downtown. Right now, I think the Apple cart stops like in front of Kilwins and in front of the school. All you need is one stop between there and there every 15 minutes. And it should run seven days a week, May through October. Um, you know, and, and so something along that line at each end. Um, so I just said, okay, there's your number one priority. How do you pay for it? How do you pay for it? So... Revenues, paid parking. If you did paid parking between nine and six, nine hours a day, and two dollars per hour with a four hour time limit instead of three hours. Just so you know, there's been a lot of studies done that say when it comes to people shopping and dining in downtown like Blowing Rock, that the average people will spend four hours. You're chasing them away at three hours before they're done spending money. And if they're moving their car, you're just creating more traffic congestion. And, and uh, so if you did that, July, if your parking downtown was at 90% occupancy, and right now it's generally closer to 100%, not at 9 o'clock, it's generally like 11 o'clock is when it really fills up. But that would generate, this is how much money you would generate. And I don't know if these percentages, I haven't been here November through April. Do you even have, do you have less than half of your downtown parking full? You know, this is how much money it could generate. And so, and then May, June at 60%, you know, which you're probably above that. I'm trying to be conservative with these. Total, that's how much money you would generate. Just downtown. And, um, and if you, if we went to like passport parking, I'm going to show you that, or park mobile or any of these where, I'll show you that in a second, uh, somebody to establish the system, you'd still end up with about 1.3 million a year. You know, so 15 or 20 years, you pay for your parking structure and your trolley. But then out at the parking structure, I don't think it should be free. But let's say you did 600 parking spaces and it was a dollar an hour up to a maximum of $5. So if I was an employee, I could park downtown, pay $8 for only four hours. I could go out there and spend my eight hour working shift for five bucks. Guess where I'm going to park? So you make it and you can even have businesses say, I'm going to go buy parking passes at that garage for my employees, 
with a shuttle running every 15 minutes to incentivize your employees to park there, not what's most convenient. So it's cheaper. You could be there for 24 hours for, for five bucks, or you could only be four hours downtown for eight bucks. So it incentivizes people to stay out there. And I think doing uh, merchants, where merchants are saying, I'm going to pay the parking for my employees out there at five bucks a day. Or maybe if merchants do that, you give it to them for four bucks a day per employee. You know, but whatever it is. And so these are just initial. These, the recommendation isn't going to include these physical numbers. It's just trying to have our mindset right now. If that garage was at only 40% annually, which means December through April, if you're only half full downtown, why would they park out there? Now, granted, they're going to pay to park downtown, so it's still cheaper out there. But if that parking garage was empty six months of the year, so only 40%, and it wouldn't be, because I guarantee people are going to always take the cheaper option where they can park all day. But even if it only ran at 40% occupancy, that's how much you would generate in only 360 days. I took five days where it might be closed for painting or repair or cleaning or whatever. Five days during the year probably wouldn't be that many. But then a parking shuttle, I refined our numbers on the parking shuttle. I actually started getting information from other places that have parking shuttles. I had 265, I raised it another 50 grand a year to run that shuttle. And that would still net you 122,000, okay? So I'm trying to give you the actual numbers. This is preliminary. We still have a lot of research to do. And by the way, even trolleys could do onboard display advertising. Up there we see those lit things are places where you could do trolley. You can see some brochures. Let's see if I can make this. Brochures could be right there, but there's onboard advertising that could go up here. But, but so they can generate a little bit of revenue inside the trolley. I don't want outside the trolley. But, but once again, there's an opportunity there. You can see they have display space up here. So Tweetsy or, you know, a mystery house, anybody, they might say, well, we want, we want, or even, you know, local lodging might buy some advertising on board the trolley. So with all of this, there you go. Now, this is gross parking revenue, so this does not include enforcement. It does not include maintenance. It doesn't include some of those things. So these are gross parking revenues after the cost of the trolley. That's what you would generate. So now, with this, um, if you did that and you had an annual debt service of 2% over 20 years, you know, with an annual payment, that's about what you would be paying a year to fund this 600 space parking structure. By the way, you might end up with two 300 space parking structures. And, and I think the town has an engineering firm it, it has on retainer. And sh are they already kind of looking into this? And, and the town's already saying, let's start looking into this. Because I don't have a location yet. We don't know what's feasible, what makes sense. But there's your estimated revenues, gross revenues. There's your debt service. There's your reserve. With that much, in less than one year, you could pay for an entire wayfinding system. You could pay for, for a whole bunch of other great improvements to make this more pedestrian friendly. I mean, there's all kinds of room there. And so that's, and so even if I'm way off on the numbers, if I'm way off in the numbers, you're still going to be good. And so I just, you know, consider this. Using the reserve funds, you could design and install a complete wayfinding system, pedestrian, trails, and, and vehicular wayfinding, which you need. And this leaves funds to purchase the two rubber tire trolleys, the parking structure maintenance, insurance, utilities, because they're going to be lit, additional public safety improvements, and a rainy day fund. Not bad. And um, there are other alternatives. We've even seen cities, they will condo park. They will actually sell a number of parking spaces. 
And so they pay annual dues. But a business could say, I want to buy 20 spaces. And they're actually helping fund the construction of it. So that's another thing. I've seen sponsorships at, at Olympic venues. We've worked in a lot of the Olympics. Um, and when we work at Olympics, uh, and, and even back in the day when we had world fairs, we actually had floors sponsored. So inside the parking garage, they would paint the concrete walls with murals like McDonald's. People can't remember what floor did I park on, one, two, three. They can't remember numbers. They can't remember colors. But they remember brands. I've seen them make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year sponsoring floors with advertising inside the parking garage, not outside. I, I'm just giving you, then of course the pay parking, which we already talked about. Um, you know, we've seen revenue bonds, we've seen development mitigation creates shared parking. Um, you know, this is, this is when new businesses come in, you know, um, and they say, we don't have any parking, and so they might have an impact fee. I think 15,000 is pretty high, but, but having that, that's another way. So, you know, municipal, these are just all ways to pay for this. But I don't know anybody, you know what? If somebody come, if a visitor comes in Blowing Rock that's not willing to pay eight bucks, do you want them? I mean, think about that. You know, I, I think pay, paying eight dollars to park downtown, I think, is a bargain. Is that major? Is that the only way to do it? Major? Meter? I'll show you that in a second. Okay. I'll show you that in a second. Yes, I'm glad you asked that question because there's Passport USA, um, Passport Parking, Pango, Pay by Phone, uh, Park Mobile, and this gets into this whole meter thing. Benefits to the city. There's no, so now we're talking about meters. What, how do we do this? Um, no cost to the city or town, parking enforcement. You need to have web capable devices so you know because everything's web. Customer pays a convenience fee. In this case, it would be built in. I already took 15% out. So to pay these companies to set it up, they provide the stickers and apply them. And then city see a 20% increase in revenues um, by doing this. These are people that already went from standard meters with coins to that. Now, according to Park Mobile, no feeding the meter anymore. Um, 15 minute text reminders. And I'm going to show you more about this. Free mobile app, opt in local information. You can say, while you're here, did you know? Consumers can find businesses in proximity to their parking space on the app. You know, real-time payment, you only pay for the time you actually park there. So this is places that have already had meters. So this doesn't apply to Blowing Rock. They will give you all three choices. You can pay by phone, coin, or pay station. Um, and so I'm going to quickly go through this. But, but so this is Wisconsin, Dell's Wisconsin. You could do this, a sticker like that, and it could be on a small post. But, you know, right out here in front of uh, the chamber office, there's the farmer's market. There's some duct tape stuck down there, and it has, like, parking stalls. Is that for the farmer's market? That's for what? Park. Oh, parking. Okay. But even those little duct tape things, you could even do this without posts. You could even mount them. On, right on the curb, although then my only challenge is that for some people you're going like this with your phone. You know, but a lot of times once you have the app, you just say, oh, it's, it's zone number three, space number 12. You just say I'm in zone number three, space number 12. I'll show you that. So you don't always have to have meetings. This was me, first time I ever used one of these. I scanned the QR code, I just walked up to that and I did my phone. This is for people with smartphones. And then I had the app. And then it says, it says, oh, you must be in Wisconsin Dells. I gave myself a username and password. I put in the zone and space right there. Then I then input a credit card. I know this, some people are going to go, I don't want to go through this. I told it how long I wanted to pay. It included the prices on the app. And that whole thing, it told me the following. Not to worry, the meter won't show any time, but we know you paid for your parking. And it will text me 15 minutes of parking. So if I say I want one hour, at 45 minutes, I will receive a text that says, 
Your parking meter is going to expire in 15 minutes. Do you want to add another hour? And then right, if I'm sitting in a restaurant, I say, yes, give me another hour. At four hours, because you have four hour max, it will say at three hours and 45 minutes, send you a text that says, in 15 minutes, your parking meter is going to expire. Just want to give you a heads up, because after that, you could be given a ticket. And, and that whole thing, uh, that whole thing, setting it up, took me about three minutes. And once it's set up, I can use it any city, anywhere. I don't know what Boone uses, but I hope whatever you get, it's the same thing Boone has, so that people that are going downtown Boone don't have a different experience here. You know, I, and I'm not sure what they use. But... That's somebody that's on a smartphone a lot. Yes. But you could, even, you could even do this. You could even send out to all your residents a mailer that says, by the way, in three months or in a month, we're going to start doing paid parking downtown. If you write at your house, if you have a smartphone, go ahead and set it up right now. That way, when you go downtown, all you do is you pull up the app and say, I'm in zone this and space this, and then tell how long you want to park and you're done. So I think there's ways to do that. And you know what? I'm trying to help. So sometimes you say, am I willing to go through that hassle? But here's the deal. The other option is you don't have to do that at all. If you have a flip phone or whatever, these you would have every block. So you can walk up to that. You can pay by coin the old-fashioned way. You can pay by cash. You can pay by credit card. You could, you know, you could go there. And it will print out a little slip and you just put that on your dash. So that's, there is that, you always give people an alternative. And so uh, in this case, there's not even power running to this. It actually has a solar panel on top so that it, it has its own battery and stuff. So we're not creating a real hassle just putting in these things. Um, and so there's always going to be that option. In like Wisconsin Dells, they took parking lots that didn't have paid parking and they just, so there's no meter there. It's just the zone number, you know, at the top and the space number. And, and but for you, the last thing I'd want to see is metal posts. But I just wanted to show you how these work, you know, just so you could do that. But I have seen towns just put this sticker right on the curb. It's just right on the curb. So there's no trip hazards, there's nothing. And they do have to be, now there is a problem, like what do we do when there's snow removal? So I understand there's always, everything isn't that cut and dried easy. But, but um, let me do a couple more and then, I, so, so here it is. Space 184, four hours, $2.35, done. But these posts that you have, these wood posts, I hope you don't do metal in your downtown. It's just not who you are. I love the wood posts you have on your parking sign that you have here uh, in front of the visitor information. Um, I, these posts down at, at Roy Hill Park down here, even see the little cap on there, even that little angled cap. You can do an angled cap on top of a post. So the top of the post, so the post is like this. And that angle, and right on the top is just your space number, you know, it has your information. So it doesn't have to be anything added to it. But you could do posts like this tall, nice wood post. Yes, there's more posts downtown now. I mean, I'm trying to figure out a way to make this work for you, to, to, to take care of the problem and still not lose your soul. But doing a post like that, I love these signs. They're wood, they're decorative. Yeah, they probably need to be painted once a year, stained, whatever it is. But you could do something like that if they're not mounted, you know, on, on, on the curb or something because of snow and other removal. So, any questions with all that? By the way, we did hear, from, we didn't hear from all these 400 responses. There was only one or two out of 400 that said, I don't want paid parking downtown. Most people said what we didn't want was a bunch of parking meters. And that I totally get. So there were people that said that. I didn't want, it wasn't about the paid parking. It was about, it was about meters and uglifying downtown. Okay, so that's first couple. Um, parking time limits is something, 
Downtowns, I would change it from three hours to four hours, the, and I would not change it until you have this, all this thing happens at once. And by the way, you, I don't think you charge for parking until you have a parking structure under construction. See what I mean? I wouldn't just charge for parking because it's free money. I mean, I want that. And by the way, I tell cities all the time that any money generated for parking is not general fund revenues. It needs to be reinvested in public safety, parking, sidewalks, anything that has to do with that. It needs to be reinvested in that alone, not to go off and just be spent on anything and everything. So the third, fourth one, pedestrian safety. Um, entire intersection should be decorative. These are things that town has approved. I do believe your sidewalks should be colored. They don't, they don't have to be bright blue or it needs to be in character, but they can be painted like in a brick color, you know, or what we call street print. And I showed this before, you know, you could do something like this that's in keeping with downtown, the historic nature of it, maybe with Blowing Rock logo, the city logo there. I don't know. These are all, this is not paint. It's actually embossed in. And this is down about three-eighths of an inch, so it doesn't just wear off. So doing these, you know, you can do whatever designs you wanted. But I think doing entire intersections, you know, like at, 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 um, at Sunset and Main and down by Speckle, the intersection of 221 and, and uh, Main, um, you know, I think you need a couple of those down at 321 and Sunset. I think doing decorative uh, intersections would be terrific. And you can see how these are embossed down in there. So it lasts like 20 or 30 years. So this, and it's already, you know, so I hope you do something that's decorative, that just in keeping with the downtown, because right now your crosswalks, you can't even tell they're there. Um, you know, but, and you see the guys doing that side, they just finished this side. That's all embossed down there, they're not pavers. So. So I think you could do some cool things that way, okay? Um, looks like a registered trademark. But once again, I think this is part of what the town, the council's already working on, but I think these are key intersections where you want traffic calming. You know, and then these you're already approving, which I think are great. And by the way, when you start adding pedestrian signals, you are gonna start seeing posts anyway. Now, in your case, it could be wood. If you don't mind the maintenance of the wood, I think it's in keeping with that story downtown. That one's down at Sunset 321. I was always shocked you had pedestrian crossing signs down there where there are no pedestrians and none up in town, which is still a state highway and where all the pedestrians are. That cracked me up, so I'm glad you're really fixing that one. Um, and then, of course, doing the gateway there, um, I showed this before, um, would just help calm this intersection here, slow traffic down. So, you know, I just think you could do something really cool there. And that's something you've talked about. And then wayfinding signage, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because I already went way over my hour. Um, but I, I do think you do need a wayfinding system. By the way, that's, this is down in Hickory. They have a really great system. Um, and then, you know, but I think just decorative signs that are in keeping with your historic. They don't need to look like this, but kind of in keeping with your, your downtown. So that'll help mitigate traffic. So what, I'm just showing you examples of wayfinding signage here. I would love to see you do, this is Greenville, South Carolina, these more to explore signs. Because you have some little shops, this is more pedestrian oriented to get us down, you know, where some of the shops are kind of missed. Um, and I, I think these are really great uh, things to have. And they pay for themselves, by the way. Because each business pays like a few dollars a month to have that in there. And if the business changes, you just slide that out. This in piece comes off, you slide out, put a new one in. So you're not having to redo your signage. So these are cool ideas. And by the way, there you go. Navigation systems are not a substitute for wayfinding. So matter of fact, if you go on a navigation system, take me to Blowing Rock, they're gonna take you to the intersection of Sunset and 321. You go, wow, this is downtown. I thought it was more than this. See what I mean? Because there's no wayfinding. So there you go. Okay. And so we've talked about this before. Number six, 
you know, I still believe this should be somewhere where people can People always want a selfie spot. And I think where that's located now, I don't know where it should go. If you guys have any ideas, where would we put this sign so people can stand in front of it and get their picture taken? I think it's a really cool sign. I don't know where it should be, but somewhere, if somebody has an idea, let me know. I'd be happy to make a recommendation. I just think it's in a really unfortunate spot right now. Um, there's no way you can take a picture there. Number one, it's too high. There's trucks and everything is stacked in front of it. And then number seven, affordable housing. I don't, I believe this needs to not be handled by Blowing Rock. It needs to be handled by the county. This is a county issue. Um, and, and, and I think that's really important. The county should have or develop a housing authority. I was actually shocked that this county, not Caldwell County, your county, that most of you are in, it does not have a housing authority. I'm shocked. It's a university town in Boone. And now we're not talking about low income housing. We're talking about low to moderate income housing, which is housing addressed for people that do have jobs. I kept looking at that ABC store down there on the highway going, my gosh, would that be cool if you had an apartment complex there? That would be look nice. It's got the pond out in front with fountains in it. You know, I don't know, you know, parking and that's where Twigs is. But, but I just kept going. But maybe it's even in Boone. When we talk to frontline employees, they say we'd rather live in Boone anyway. It's more big boxes there. It's more of an urban setting than Blowing Rock. But I do believe this is very, very important for you. Um, the High Country Association of Realtors is embarking on a four-county housing study, but it's four counties. I ain't got to work with one county. I think that would be very helpful, and that's something I heard from the realtors. I think, good news, at least they're working on that. Okay? And then, you know, you need to do one locally, and then better communication. One of our recommendations is that the town hire a PIO, a public information officer. You're about to tear up Main Street, and boy, is there going to be a need for that. I think that uh, Shane um, has enough to do, you know, without being a public information officer, along with everything else that's going on, even implementing the stuff in this plan, which a lot of it's going to fall on the town, you know, and the TDA. But I think you need to hire somebody. I was really surprised that a town like this does not have a public information officer. You need to get somebody that's young and enthusiastic, that is really good at community building, that is a communications expert at writing, video, and, and conversational. Um, they are social media savvy. They're press savvy. And, and do I have any more? They, they would coordinate the message from the town, the TDA, the chamber, downtown, particularly if you create a downtown association down the road or do a master development plan. There's a lot of things that I think you need somebody there. One of the biggest complaints that we heard from people was there's really no marketing to the local residents and, and also that there's a lack of communication. I think this is the one position the town really needs in a town like this, where your average daily population this time of year is closer to probably 10,000. If you take all your lodging, plus your seasonal residents, plus your full-time residents, you need somebody that's dedicated to outreach to the people that live here. That would help, that would really help your locals. So they know what's up, what's going on. The top three things we discussed at the last council meeting, those types of things I think are really, really important. So that's what we have so far. The conversation is still active. So we're not, these are, these are recommendations we're gonna make. None of them are refined yet. So the timeline for doing this whole plan is that. There's our online questionnaire. The next two months, we're going to be researching. We're going to research everything so that when we provide recommendations to you, it's really well thought out with even more input. And then in October is when I physically will be writing this plan. And this is, I will come back in November and say, here's your tourism development plan. And I will do that in a public presentation for you. Does that make sense? 
So this, right now, we're still in all the research, but I wanted to give you an idea of where we're headed and what we've heard so far. And I think that was really important. One thing I always want you to remember is I showed this in a webinar, you know, I, I just, I, and I got so many responses go, oh my God, where is that? I said, well, I wasn't trying to get more tourism here right now. Unless you want to come in the winter, we're fine. But I just said, look at what you have here. I, 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 I can't believe every time, we've been here for three weeks, and you know what? Every single day I go, wow. Every day I go, wow. I mean, I just think, I, this morning, there were people out here working in the gardens, you know, and I just thank them for doing that. I don't know if you have master gardeners here, but they do an amazing job. I don't think I have ever seen a town hall photographed as much as yours anywhere in the world that I've ever been. I mean, wow. You know, just look at this. And by the way, typical, typical audience I, I just think that what you have is so amazing. I, I just think it's amazing. If you could fix the parking and the traffic, this, this, I can't think of a better town in the United States if you could mitigate and fix those issues. I mean, I, I just, these are just snapshots I've taken over the last few weeks. You know, family friendly, even though I use the you know, brew house for that. But you really look at it, it's all full of families. You know, and, and I, you know, people are just going, wow. You know, and so, I mean, even, you know, the things you have for families to do here, I, I, it's phenomenal. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And this is from somebody that's worked all of the Rockies. We've worked in other mountain communities. We've worked, you know, Great Smokies, you know, all over the place. I mean, just look at this. You know, this isn't next to Asheville. This is next to you. I mean, it's just, I can't wait to come here in the winter. You know, I mean, I just see these pictures. I grabbed that off of Google Images. I just went, this place is absolutely fantastic. I mean, you know, and I showed this before. You know, uh, how many people have all of these in one spot? Hardly anybody. You can't find all that in Savannah, Georgia. You know, not that I want you to even be Savannah. You can't find it anywhere. And I thought this, written 101 years ago, it's just as true today as it was then. I think it's awesome. I took that at Brom. I think what you have is just flat out amazing. With that, sorry it took longer than I thought I was going to do. Any questions? I don't mind hard questions. Yes, sir. I've got a mild disagreement. Okay. One thing you said sure. Well, now, okay. Let me, let me Go ahead. I was a bit roomy back then at Phoenix Sharp, which just this year blew past San Francisco to be the 15th largest yes. city. Yes. The third largest yes. city. I agree. Yeah, so, so what I mean is not going to lull. I don't think you will ever go, I don't think it's ever going to, I don't think your tourism will drop that much. So I, I want to make that really clear. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I've heard from a few people, like your housing sales are like through the roof, so you're actually building population. You're right. With Charlotte coming here, you're right. You're, you know what? I, that's a good, really good argument. I'm glad you mentioned that. See what I mean? I mean, I think you're right. With Charlotte growing as fast as it is, and, and that's a lot of your tri day trippers are coming from that area. So, yeah. yeah. This is because, well, wait a second. Because one thing I don't want you to do is say, well, if he thinks there's going to be low, then we don't need a parking garage. No, 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 no. So thank you very much. I agree. So, what, let, just a second, right here, and yeah. Um, as a long-term resident, I view the number of tourists as problematic. Um, I don't want okay. people downtown because I don't want to fight the crowd. Right. And so, it, I was a little surprised that the presentation seems to have the underlying assumption that we want to grow tourism. 
Nope. I would like to see it limited. Okay. Another so, cycle is, you know, if you're yes. on noise, think in force of animals. Yes. So. I just, in my view, that the quality of life is degraded. Okay. And, and you're not alone in that. And that's what we're trying to help Every fix. So. Uh, okay. So. So let me, let me clarify that. She said that it sounds like I'm trying to be, make this even more tourism. Number one priority, I think, is to spread out your visitors over more of the year instead of having so much in a peak season. You know what I mean? Spread them out so that you're more, so that you have maybe. But, but you know what? This is a free country. You can't put out signs out there at 321 said, sorry, we have too many visitors. We're turning you away at the gates. Well, I'm not too sure. I haven't even, I didn't even talk about marketing yet. Um, and, and so this is, we're still listening. And so, so I do believe, but, but I got to tell you that I have not talked to one single retail merchant that said we are too busy. I have not talked to one single restaurant that said we are full year round. I have not talked to one single lodging property that says we have way, way too many visitors that we can handle. Um, I have not talked to anybody that owns a business or runs a business anywhere in or around Bowling Rock that says we're over, we're, we're suffering from over tourism, except in parking and in the traffic issues compounded by the lack of parking. However, I have talked to people that says during this time, July and August, we're already at capacity. We don't need more visitors here. I've talked to lodging in July and August that said we're still not full during the week. So, so this is not about, this is about mitigating the visitors you already have coming here. This is not about bringing in more visitors. So, so I want to make that really clear. So I'm really glad you brought that up. But you're talking to business owners. Are you talking to residents? Yes. I know, yes. So, so here's what I would like to hear from you is how do we tell visitors to quit coming here? See what I mean? It is a free country. You're in the, as a matter of fact, when you do reverse advertising like that, they're gonna come here even more often. And so, so this is a free country. You are in the mountains. And, and if Charlotte is now the 15th largest metropolitan, they're still gonna come here. We can, you can always in your marketing and social media say, you know what? The best time to visit is in April or in November or whenever you do have some openings. You know, I mean, it's totally up to you, but I don't know how you tell visitors to stay away, you know, because we're trying to make this more livable for our residents. So just saying, so Tim first and then, then you. Just around the same point, I think the demographics are changing in Rock. The 1300. Okay. No, that is the number of residents according to the U.S. Census Bureau which for 2020. The, which is also the number of registered voters. It's yeah. roughly the same number. I, I wouldn't think so because there might be people that live in Blowing Rock that... Uh, the, there's, according to the, let me make this clear. According to the U.S. Census, it goes by number of residents in 2020 and not by registered voters. Okay. I get, I get, okay. okay. I'll accept this okay. number. That's, <laughs> Yeah. That number drives a lot of thinking. The reality is the demographics are changing. We, okay. have, a, we have a large population of people that are here year-round that live in, in surrounding areas who are okay. here all the time. In sure. And, in and out. And in sure. And so there's that layer. Yes. And then there's a whole new layer of people that have moved here recently with families and kids that are filling up the schools. So um, when we talk about um, the, you know, the residents yeah. Uh, and homeowners in Boring Rock, that number is really the affected population is different in 1300. Y yes. It, it's, you know, uh, if you take, if, if we said, and I don't know this for positive, but I've heard anecdotally that about two thirds of the residents are part time residents, seasonal residents, or whether weekend, whatever you want to call it, which would give you an effective population of 5,200 people versus 1,300. Um, except during those shoulder season months. And the only reason where that comes into play is some people said, well, we don't have enough business downtown that cater to the local residents. 
well, there's not enough year-round residents to make those work for some of those businesses. I think that may be worth exploring. Okay, yeah, I think absolutely. Not exactly true anymore. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this is, nothing's a done deal here except the need for parking. <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's great. Yes? Absolutely. Yes. So what my appeal is that we do think, I do think, and I think many people in the place of pay property taxes, and I have for 20 years, and I've been coming here for 50 sure. years with residents, so I'm not an ignorant in that regard, but is that the commercial, retail, and business interests have tipped the scale so much that we all want it to be wonderful, and we want all those things to be a part of the experience. But now the leverage is too great in that direction. Therefore, when we talk about the tourism plan, mm -hmm. um, to me, there needs to be much more focus on um, where are we spending the tourism dollar to draw who we're drawing, and why can't we think more creatively about flipping the advertising and marketing to a, a different thrust? Mm -hmm. And uh, the focus should lead with quality of life. So to me, parking has got to be solved, but you have done a great job just discerning that 400 parking places are employed in the state. So therefore, if you're dealing with that piece of it, that is a tremendous value to you being here from the get-go. But there are many other pieces that need to go into this. And to me, it's not just about Main Street. Now, um, so, so one thing I want to talk about, and this I've heard this many times, is it, by North Carolina state law, there's lodging taxes, and those are paid by visitors. And most cities somehow think that's just free money that we could go use for whatever. By state law, it has to be used for the promotion and development of tourism, with one-third going to product development and two-thirds going to marketing. And I've heard from many people in Blowing Rock, we'd like to flip that. Here's why I don't think that will ever happen. And I, remember, I've worked this in all 50 states. 
is lodging taxes were developed by hoteliers to put heads in beds. And by state law, tourism is meant promoting your area to people 50 miles or further away. And that's like, well, how do we do this? We need to market to the locals that are here. You know what I mean? And they're, when they bring friends and family. And so, and so flipping that would have to be an act of the legislature at the state level. And so, but, but even when it comes to that, I have not even talked to Tracy or Amanda that the two people you have doing tourism, it's with that two thirds, how are you spending it? When are you spending it? Is there something we could do with that money that's other than just making this even more, too many more visitors? And I haven't even talked to them about budgets yet. I haven't even talked about what they spend, when they spend it, where they spend it, who they spend it on. You know, there's one thing, I think that they could use one more person more than advertising. I think they could use another person to help work with locals more because locals, the number one reason people travel is to visit friends and family. Those are visitors. And so I think more than advertising dollars, you know, and I haven't even talked to them about budget. And, and, um, and even Tracy has said, boy, you know, he's not, uh, is how do we make this work? And that's what we're trying to do. So, so I'm not suggesting, I'm not going to go to them and say, you guys need to do television advertising to get people here in July and August, or even June, July, August, September, October. And so, uh, but I don't, I think changing the state law would be something you have to do at the state legislature if you want to make that more 50-50. Actually, North Carolina, in, in most other states, and I could probably name 30 of them, a hundred percent has to be used for the promotion and development of tourism. Well, I think so was, that's. I mean, some of us are here from the Raleigh area, and yeah. um, uh, you know, they, they use hotel and lodging tax for um, museums and yeah. all kinds of other things. So I, I think. They, Same as they do here. So we will look at those. So Tracy. I'd love to address that, well, particularly on the marketing side. I'll jump up here so you don't have to crick your neck. Because remember, I haven't even talked to them at all yet. And uh, I appreciate some of the points. I think some of you have been misinformed on some of where our money goes. Um, we did, of course, pay for the, I say we, our visitors, pay for the property that Brahm is sitting on. Uh, we continue to pay on the parking decks that are here now. In terms of our advertising, as soon as we saw what was happening in June, which he doesn't have a crystal ball, nor do we, we stopped all call to action advertising. Did we cut it for COVID? So whoever's here this year, they're this year. Absolutely. We didn't, how much did we cut our advertising last year? About 40%. 40%. And, you know, and we stopped. It's a free country. What we are doing right now with the advertising side of our budget is working on content, newer pictures, nicer images. We're not asking anybody to come. And, and shoulder season, more shoulder season. That's all. So, Thanks. yeah. Yes. Um, just real quick, because I know you're still listening. And oh, yeah. I want to know how many weekends you're here for left. This is my last one for this trip. This weekend? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Make this happen, but I think it would be very interesting this weekend while you're here or get this for you to analyze. But let's see what people are doing from above because we're all down here and we can't see where they're getting stopped. Like you were saying, you're turning around on the. It, I wish we had it for the 4th of July. But I bet. I was here that weekend too, yeah.
I, okay. So what? So I've been doing that for 20 days here, and it's not me making up stuff. I have sat out there, but I sit out there at Memorial Park, down there at 321. I have physically watched. I'll take a car and I'll watch what it does. The one thing I don't want you to do as a town is go out and start hiring more people to do parking studies and traffic studies and everything. I think that you, through wayfinding, so for instance, I've sat out there at the entrance of South Main and 321, North Main 321, Sunset and 321, and I've sat there and watched and actually counted vehicles. I mean, for 20 days straight, and, and except for one day. And that's when I was at, when I went out to the high games. And that was my day off. Um, and so, and so I, I don't, I, I think it's really obvious the problem, but through wayfinding, I hope, you know, I, you know, when I come here from the Lonora direction, I take South Main. I do it because I love that little bit of drive. You know, but I would never put wayfinding and say, that's the way to downtown. I would direct them through wayfinding up Sunset and through North Main, where you have mainly residential and the res Chatola and the resorts and maybe where are parkings. So a lot of this could be mitigated with wayfinding signage. How do you want to direct traffic? And, and I will do it again this week. I mean, I've been out there. I stand there for hours and I sit there and watch it. I mean, today at 9.30, you had three quarters of your parking was empty, you know, and, and by, by, by 11, it's full. So I've seen it by hour, where I've actually been here at seven in the morning, eight in the morning, nine in the morning, 10, till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I have not been here past midnight. So I don't know what happens with the bar scene then. And so, so I think we can, I have a drone, I can put a drone up there, but I've been sitting there watching. I've talked to your police chief about traffic and everything. And, and so I, I, what I don't, I think this is really good information, but I hope you don't go out and start doing a whole bunch of more studies. I want you to, I want you to cut to the chase. And the biggest challenge you have is parking. And, and, and I think that would mitigate a lot of traffic. I'm saying, let's just take one thing, address that, um, and, and then, you know, one thing at a time. Don't bite off more than you could chew. I, that's why I like doing plans that are like three to five years. And then you come out and say, okay, things are changing. Now what is our next, our next part of that? So, Tracy. Uh, I'm sorry, we're running short on time. We've got more meetings to do. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Does anybody else have public questions? You do? <laughs> Where is it? Oh. Okay. Thank you. We'll be back. Any other questions for Mr. Brooks? Thank you. Well, so, so please, I mean, I'm taking every single one of your thoughts. I really, really taking this seriously for you as residents because I feel your pain. I get it. Um, and so I really want you, there, the, the questionnaire is still up there. The only thing that I'm putting in there that's we need better communication of public information. Off. We need parking, we need wayfind, we need some things, but it's still nothing is set in stone. So, okay? So thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. <laughs>